and let's hop into the thought for today. I'm calling it the big divide, and it's something um, that is so simple and yet so, and I don't mean this in a weird way, but so profound that it literally almost explains every situation that we deal with in life in a certain kind of way. And that's a complicated statement. I'm not going to go into all the regression analyses of the statistical methodologies to figure out how this touches everything. But here's the deal. There is, we, we live in a world that was designed to have love, all things relational, compassion, care, connection, intimacy, that, you know, mercy, helping, all of the juicy stuff that feels so good and that your brain is wired to when you experience this, you go on a drug trip. That's why people fall in love. You can't even get them to drive down the street in the right direction because you're wired for love, okay? And we live in a universe that is wired for love. And love also means depending and trusting and getting from each other the fuel that we need to take the next step. That's love. But that's only half the picture. Love, without the other side, which is truth or structure. See, love has got to work in a certain way or it becomes something not very loving and not very helpful. And the other side of the universe is we can't just have love we have to at least have language to hold it together. And that's truth. That's structure. We have to structure our love. Now, these are two parallel tracks that run through virtually everything that we do. That there's something, some good in something, but in order for it to be good, it's got to be done a certain way. It's got to have structure. It's got to have truth. There's principles that guide it. Got that? These two things. Now let's give you some derivative words for a second that you this will make more sense to you. If we're talking about love and truth, what the Bible talks about grace and truth, here's what you see. What would what would a secular way of, you know, if you didn't use the religious language, you go to see a shrink and you got a problem with your 14-year-old. Guess what? That problem is probably going to be interfaced by somehow these two sides are not integrated, or as the Bible says, they have not kissed each other. And the shrink is going to say to you, well, we need to get some watch these two things, we need to get some love and limits coming together. Because Mr. Jones or Mrs. Jones, here's the problem with your son. You're loving him and loving him and loving him, but he has no limits. He has no structure. He has no, no truth that he's got to live up to and be required, have some expectations in the midst of this love. So see the universe is imbalanced and out of balance in this relationship is imbalanced. And so the kid's kind of going nuts because he doesn't have enough structure. Or, this is what the shrink might say to you, Mr. Jones, I know you love your son, but 
there's not a lot in there that's going to help him to feel that because all you ever talk about is the rules and how he's screwing up and the expectations and this side of the world, how he's failing, not living up. Well, kids need boundaries. Yeah, they do. But as science tells us and as the Bible tells us, fathers do not exasperate your children with anger or cause them to become disheartened because you're too harsh. So we don't want to be enablers and we don't want to be critical, judgmental. What we want to do, what we want to strive for in all of life is what one of my favorite verses says, and it's in Psalm something. <laughs> um, I'm going to guess it's 85, but it might be Psalm 68. Um, it's in a Psalm that has double digits. How about that? Here's what it says. It says that righteousness and mercy. See, there are a lot of different words for this these two things, mercy, kindness, grace, love, and then the righteousness, and, you know, truth and all this kind of stuff. It says that these two in God, they have met. Indeed, they have kissed. See, they're not in conflict. You don't kiss somebody that you're in conflict with, do you? No, you kiss somebody that you are embracing and want to join and see what happens is a lot of times in relationships you take an enabling relationship with an addict and somebody wants to kiss that addict and they love them but to set some limits and say you got to get sober you can't live here that's to add the truth and they go to kiss that and they can't kiss it because they're in conflict with putting those together but then what happens? Addie comes home drunk and all of a sudden, whoop, you switch over to the other side. I can't believe you're drinking again. I told you. And now we're all truth and there's no love in there. And the truth is unusable when it does not have love. That's why the Bible says that the law, which was right, was useless, as Paul says, powerless to help us change. And he says the law was given through Moses. Well, how'd that work out? Moses came off the hill with a diet. And we know the research on diets. He said, eat this, don't eat this. Do these things, don't do these things. Well, there you go. Didn't work too well. But then Paul says, well, that was useless. that this gospel of grace is what has the power. And one of my favorite verses says in John 1 that the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized. They kissed each other. They came together in Jesus Christ. He was the picture of both. He would say to someone caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you. Don't go keep doing that. See, that's love and limits coming together. And that love is going to motivate and change us and help us get our act together. An addict goes to a recovery group. And they walk in and people don't go, I can't believe you're drunk. What's wrong with you? Don't you love your family? No, he walks in or she walks in and says, hi, I'm Sally or I'm Jim. They go, hey, Sally. Hey, Jim. Good to have you here. That's the embracing of the love side. And then they work some steps that are the embracing of the truth side and having a moral inventory in the midst of this love. So kind of good thing here. Think about this love and limits going together. How about for you? If I lived inside your head, which might be a lot better than the one I live in, if you got, you know, if any of you are inviting me, um, <laughs> there are days I'd much rather live in yours. But if I lived inside your head and I watched the conversation going on there, when you don't meet the expectation, do you give yourself input about how you're doing? With love 
or are love and limits, grace and truth really divided? How do you do it? You know what's going to happen to your head? If all you got is critical voices in there and there's no love, your head's going to kind of not do so well. It's going to generate stuff that psychologists call depression. It's going to generate anticipatory failure that psychologists call anxiety. But then, you know, maybe I'm hanging around in your head and all I see in there is excuses and enabling and it's not that big a deal. It's somebody else's fault. And you're kind of letting yourself off the hook with no, no limits whatsoever. That doesn't end well either. See, the only way life works is when we put these two together. So just go through your day internally and as you address others. Don't be on one side of the fence. Take the fence down. And make the whole yard, one yard of an integrated life where you have values, but you live those values out in a loving way. Now, when I said this is going to touch every single part of life, just go read, read the newspaper any given day. And what are you going to see? You're going to see one side saying, we need to be tougher on these people. You know, say, be on the other side, hear the other side saying, we need to give more. We need to love more. Well, we can't afford that. Well, don't we care? And you see it with parents. He or she knows more rules. Well, you know, it's a sensitive kid and his big brother's not being nice to him and we need to cut him some slack. When a company, we got to cut budgets. Well, we can't like have any layoffs. Well, we won't survive. Well, but what about the... See, every single context of life is always going to somehow kind of get us to struggle with reality and being loving in reality and also bringing reality the way that we love. To structure love, for example. You know, when my girls were little, I wanted to love them and be a source for them and say, you know, be cool if you had had a few shekels to go spend. Thank you, Daddy. Give me some money. I go, well, I'm going to give it to you, sort of. But you got to learn where money comes from. You know where it comes from? It's not the trees. Doesn't come from Daddy. Money comes from work that's where it comes from a source of good things you can say that's that's on the loving side of the equation work that's an expectation yeah pretty much anything of value has a cost to it life's double ledger that's the best thing i got out of being an accounting major before i switched to psychology but i found out you know there's no good thing in life that doesn't cost something if you got a bunch of expenses and you're not getting anything good out of it, then you've got a losing proposition and that's bad business. If you find one that you can have profits and that doesn't cost you anything to get to those profits, then I think you got a trust fund. That's what you have. You don't have a business. See, both sides of these things are going to come in. And what I used to tell the girls is, yeah, I want you to have money and here's your chores or whatever. And, you get paid for that. And if you don't do them, you don't. These things always have to be equal, right? See, it, it just enters every area of life. And when you're talking about having a relationship, it gets pretty important to love your, whoever your, your significant other, whoever that is, whether you're dating or married or friendship or extended family. But if we have love that is not structured, 
In other words, if you love somebody and there are no expectations in the relationship, I don't mean expectations for the love. Don't get me wrong. Both of those have to always be present. The love is not conditional. The love has got to be integrated with. So if I love you, I also have expectations. No, you can't talk to me like that. Or if you do, I'll go somewhere else. I want to help you. If I help you, I'm expecting you to spend that on school books and not on drugs. Or that doesn't feel good when you talk to me that way. I would like for you to speak to me in a different way. See, that makes love work. If we don't have the expectations and the truth that structures the way that we love, then the love will break down. Just like when you drive a car and you don't do it according to the manual, it is not going to go well. Well, love has to be done in certain ways. Now, as a person of faith, I can tell you what I believe. I believe that those are wired into the universe. That's why codependents get resentful, people. Codependents keep giving, but it always comes out that they're either hurt, it's getting taken out on them, or they're resentful because they feel like they're being taken advantage of. See, the giving is still going to have expectations. They're just going to go silent because in the universe, love and justice are together. They're not split. And we can't ever get away from that. The question is, are we going to align ourselves with it or not? We can't cheat. And you can't be harsh and have expectations and criticize people and expect for love to thrive. The love is going to go poisoned. It'll still be there because the need will still be there. And the need is so great in that relationship that the person will begin to feel let down, betrayed, abused, and abandoned. And if there were no love, you couldn't feel that stuff. So you can't ever get away from it, can you? See, if somebody is critical to me that I don't give a you-know-what about, I don't feel abandoned. I don't feel hurt unless I got a trigger somewhere. I look at them and go, dude, sorry you're having a bad day. But if it's somebody I need and I'm attached to and I love and they're critical and they come at me with no love, then I get hurt. See, that's the love side still there, but being poisoned. So if you want things to work, here's my suggestion. Get on the right side of the laws of the universe and they will work for you. You can fly if you're an engineer and you know the laws of physics, you can build a plane in a certain way that when, when you do that, it rises because you understand the laws of physics. You can build it that negate the laws of physics and do that and it dies. Do you want to soar? Of course we do. But we got a problem. A lot of times we have a conflict between these two. We can't kiss them, as I said earlier. See, love and limits, grace and truth, righteousness and mercy have to kiss each other. They got to be pals inside of us. And if we're divided, I feel bad when I confront somebody. Or I get so angry when I confront somebody, I don't show love. See, they're not kissing, are they? And they've got to start by kissing inside of us. And then they can flow outward. So that's a little tip for today. Get love and limits to be friends. Your life will go better.